tune to Tomorrow Never Knows with me, Bob Wilson, and Sir Warren Brown of the Beatles Kingdom. Our friend John Barber returns to tell us more in his exciting new autobiography, share his Beatle thoughts, and tell us about all the legends he's known. And he's also known as the fifth Beatle. And as we start, I just have to say hello to our sponsor, which is Beatles Magazine, a publication with 370 plus million visitors in all their pages, read by thousands of fans around the world every day. Beatles News is updated daily, 24 hours, audio, video, photos, interviews, even contests, additional materials, and more. Follow Beatles Magazine, the most complete online coverage, 24 hours a day and eight days a week. And our, our guest has a great new book that we're going to get into called Your Mother's Not a Virgin, The Bumpy Life and Times of the Canadian Dropout Who Changed the Face of American TV. But as we look at the wall behind him, which is extremely impressive. It's got his JFK documentaries on there, which have been a lot to my life and my way of thinking. He's got his Superman poster, but mixed in there is a fellow named Ernie Kovacs. And my friend John Barber has done a great documentary on him, and I didn't know about it till recently. And the more I learned of uh, Mr. Kovacs, I am more and more impressed. So can I please start off by asking you about that? <laughs> yes, you certainly can. And thank you so much for mentioning the book. Let me ask you a question, because I love the fact that Beatles Magazine sponsors you. Would Beatles Magazine run a, uh, run a review of my book in their magazine? And not a review written by you or Warren. Not but, written by me. No, a, a review. I was just going to offer. I, no, a review written by Mike Farrell, who was the uh, second leading star of uh, the TV series MASH. As a matter of fact, um, Mike had been a guest on my show. I had not mentioned uh, uh, I had not mentioned my book to him, and he heard about it, and he has it. So I sent him a copy, and I had never met him in person. And about eight months ago, he called me on a Sunday, and he and his wife uh, Shelley, uh, uh, is, uh, who's also a fabulous actress, he was telling me that they were taking turns reading excerpts of the book to one another and laughing and crying. He said he was halfway through and he was going to send me a great review when he finished. And I thanked him. And sure enough, a couple of months later, when he finished the book, 752 pages, he sent me this glorious review, which is now up on Goodreads. And there are dozens and dozens up on Amazon, all five star. So do you think if I send you one of these that your friend, uh, the lovely lady who lovely owned Rita. this? Lovely Rita. Yeah. Would you think that she would put this, uh, one of the reviews in her magazine? I can I almost just... guarantee it. I can almost, get, I can't speak for her, but if I could, I can almost guarantee that that will be in there if you promise to tell me about Ernie Kovac. Okay. Um, <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute, John. Um, I I can speak for lovely Rita. Um, now we're in trouble. Uh, she has written me back and said uh, that you need to get a hold of her in order for her to do that for you. Well, I can't get a hold of her. I don't have her contact information. Uh, um, you just go to Beatles Magazine, and you should be able to contact her on there through the messenger. You, you do I can make that much easier for you if I'm allowed to privately later when we're not recording. Remind me of your number, and I'll give that to her, and you just give me a time when it would be okay for her to call. We'll edit all this out later, and yeah. I will provide it. I can guarantee it. No, don't edit this out. Don't. It's a live show. Just leave it alone. Uh, that would be just... Uh, Wonderful. And why is it that I'm the only one on camera here and you guys are hiding in the dark <laughs> somewhere? I have a face that was made for radio. <laughs> <laughs> and what, where are you? Now, you're not both in the same location, are we're you? We're in the same prison, but we're in different cells. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. what, what, you, guys, you guys live in New York? Or where do you live? I was born in New York, but I live in Florida. And Warren, where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, where I preside now, but I lived in Las Vegas most of my life. Well, Warren, you know, you live in Baltimore, which is a, my set, the, 
The best book ever written about anybody in show business was Ben Heck's Child, Child of the Century. Ben Heck was uh, uh, the country's uh, uh, Hollywood's leading highest paid screenwriter. He wrote Gone with the Wind in 12 wow. days and never read the book. He just read a 30 page synopsis. He wrote uh, Front Page with Charles MacArthur. And he was the first uh, propagandist for the state of Israel long before it existed. It's a fantastic book. And he was one of America's leading columnists. And his book, A Child of the Century, was the best book about anybody in show business until I wrote mine. And I stole an idea from him. And, the, and he wrote every one of his articles, not like a chapter heading, but like a newspaper column. And so that's that's my book. But the reason I, you, I, I spunked up when you mentioned Baltimore, his hero when he was a young writer was H.L. Mencken, who was mo known as the Bard of Baltimore, one of the brightest men writing in America in the 1920s and 30s. And he is the guy that said, nobody ever went broke underestimating the intelligence of the American people. Yeah. <laughs> and so there, there you go. Now to... That's great. To Ernie Co Okay, you're in Florida and Baltimore. I'm here in Las Vegas. And when we moved here, my wife said, oh, honey, you're moving to the most perfect city for you. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, why is it the entertainment capital of the world? And she says, no. It's like your mouth. It's open 24 hours a day. <laughs> so, and, and, and right That's now, important. right now, the town is mobbed and the town is mobbed because we have we have um, our Iowa version of a caucus here in Las Vegas <laughs> uh, on a week, a week from Saturday. And I think we have some kind of Democratic debates tomorrow. And I just. While, while we were talking before we went on the air, I was just posting on Facebook that the fight between the Democrats and who they elect as winner is going to be a lot more interesting, a lot more revealing than the fight between the winner and Trump yeah. in November, <laughs> believe me. So anyway, to Ernie Kovacs, like everything else I mentioned to you guys, Bob and Warren, Everything happened to me absolutely and totally by accident. And I will say, as I bragged about the book now being the second best, the best book about anybody in show business, until searching for Sugar Man, my documentary about Ernie Kovacs, which is called Ernie Kovacs, Television's Original Genius, you can go to my site, www.johnbarbersworld.com, and you can see the entire 90-minute award-winning documentary about Ernie Kovacs, which has now been reduced to the second-best documentary ever made about a performer uh, because I lost it out to searching for Sugar Man. Did you see that documentary? It won an Academy Award four or five years ago. I only see your documentaries. I wouldn't watch anything you didn't make. Well, I must tell you, Bob, you must take your time out. Sugar Man is uh, street talk for a uh, pusher, somebody who has the dope. It is the most amazing show business story I have ever heard in my entire life. I would like to tell you a little bit about it now, but we're going to talk about Ernie Kovacs, but and uh, the uh, uh, I, if you want to talk about it after Ernie Kovacs, I will. I do. It is so moving and it's so rewarding, but so is Ernie Kovacs Television's original genius. So how this all came about? Of course, I was an Ernie Kovacs fan growing up. He was my second or third favorite person on television. First. Uh, was Jack Parr. That's why I got into business because of Jack Parr, because uh, he talked to people. He was by far the best late night host of The Tonight Show, better than them, all of them combined. Not only did he do great conversations, 
But the reason I got inspired to watch it, because as a street kid, I didn't know that people actually talked to one another until I saw Barr. I thought they punched one another, they cursed at one another. <laughs> and, and then I noticed that he did a monologue at the top of the show, and that's how I happened to become uh, become a comic. So he was my hero. And then, of course, uh, 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 your show of shows with Sid Caesar. Incomparable. Nothing has come close to that. And then, of course, Ernie Kovacs, who was the Charlie Chaplin of television. He was the only one who used the media for entertainment. And when you see his work in this documentary, you will be floored. And if you're an Ernie Kovacs fan, you'll be more than floored because, because, because of the behind-the-scenes story of this remarkable talent who was killed by accident in his 40s when he was driving one of those dangerous Corvair cars. But in any event, after I was, I was fired from my own show, Real People, by George Slaughter, uh, after I had tried unsuccessfully to tell the story of Jim Garrison on one of Slaughter's shows called Speak Up America, and George Slaughter had re-edited part of the Garrison story to deliberately libel uh, Jim Garrison. And what it was he did, when I interviewed Mr. Garrison, I asked him how many shooters there were in Dilly Plaza. He said, John, there were uh, three teams, probably two men to a team, uh, and two of the teams in front, one in the back, probably the Daltex building, none at the book depository, uh, the book depository is just where they prelocated the Patsy. He said that because it was an important killing, they probably have a third who was a radio operator. And so I, I said, so you have three teams. And then I asked, how many people do you think actually knew he would not kind of come out of Dallas alive? And he said, well, the plan to kill him began on... Uh, uh, the day that uh, John Kennedy refused to allow air support at the Bay of Pigs. That's the day it, it started. He said, and it's all on a need to know basis. And since this was the most important killing of a head of state, I mean, they killed the heads of state in uh, Chile and Iran and put in fascists. And so before they could replace, turn this into a fascist society, which Garrison said, fascism will come to America under the guise of national security, which indeed it did. He said, but it's on a need-to-know basis. So I would say 32 people knew, including some in the media, uh, because they were infiltrated by the CIA and Project Mockingbird. And that, of course, turned out to be CBS with Walter Cronkite, Mike Wallace, and Dan Rather because Dan Rather's a guy who went on the air and said, oh, the bullet hits him in the back of the head and he's thrown violently forward. And fortunately in the film, we, ha we have George Carlin giving uh, CBS the, uh, the finger. So anyway, I put the story together and Marjo Gortner, who was the host of the uh, show, it was called Speak Up America, uh, was to ask the question and I had screened the eight minute, this was a part two. Part one was an enormous hit because it was the first time Garrison had ever been seen on national television in prime time unhindered. So it was the highest rating the show ever got. And people were crowding around the studio to, to come in and see part two. Anyway, when we get to Marge Joe Gortner asking Mr. Garrison, how many shooters were there? Unbeknownst to me, um, George Slaughter took uh, Donna Cantor, who was my field producer, down into the ed editing room midnight the night before and re-edited, re-edited to make Garrison look bad. So when Marcio Gartner said, how many shooters were there? We cut to Garrison and Garrison says, 32. And then the phone rings and it's George Slaughter laughing and giggling because he had made a fool of uh, Jim Garrison. Of course, I tried to talk Mr. Garrison into suing Schlatter because I had accidentally recorded his phone call. And Mr. Garrison said, John, if I ever went into court, 
I would never see my family for all the people who are libeling me. Just send me a real people t-shirt. And he also gave me the name of the fake Oswald who was in prison, who was in Leavenworth. He said, send him a fake, a real people t-shirt and he'll tell you his story too. Anyway, after I was fired, I got a call from Edie Adams. Do you know who Edie Adams was? Ernie's Ernie. wife. That's right. Edie Adams was a very pretty blonde whom Ernie met when he was doing a show locally back in Indianapolis or someplace like that. Really good singer and really attractive. And they and they had a couple of uh, baby baby girls. Anyway, she loathed George Slaughter. And I didn't know that at the time until she called me and she said, John, do you mind if I come to see you? And I said, what about? She said, well, you know uh, who my husband was? I said, yes, Ernie Kovacs. He's the only guy who made great commercials that were more interesting than, than all, any, almost any show on television. And uh, I had bunches of them. I'd say bunches of them. He, she said, I'd like to come and talk to you privately. You might. So I met her at the London Grill on Sunset Boulevard in Doheny with her publicist, who was named Henry Bollinger, and uh, my wife. And she said to me, if I could do anything in my life before I die, I would like to kill George Slaughter. And I threw my head back. I said, you're kidding. I said, why would you want to do that? He didn't cancel your show. He canceled mine. And she said, I'm sure you feel the same way. And I said, listen, I don't. I don't. The uh, two most enjoyable uh, years of my life was running Real People, the show I created. And he didn't become a monster. And Sarah didn't become a monster until the show became a hit. And that's what that's what killed it. But listen, I got my show on the air and I got my son to Stanford University and I just built a house. So I don't loathe them the way that you do. I loathe them for what he did to Jim Garrison, but not what he did to me. And so I said, why would you want to kill him? And she said, because he stole all of Ernie's material for a laugh in. Now, a lot of people don't know that uh, laugh in may have been owned by George Slaughter, but he isn't the actual creator of it. The actual creator is a fellow named Digby Wolf. This story happens to be in my book, by the way. Digby Bo Bo Wolf was a brilliant comedy writer and alcoholic, and he's the one that thought up the name Laugh In because at the time we had all these sit ins and all around the country for civil rights. And see, he's in a supermarket one day, and he said, Hey, why not Laugh In? And to get the, and, and nothing was to be more than like six or eight or 12 seconds. But nobody in television was doing that. Not even your show of show. The only person doing it was Sid Caesar. So Slaughter stole all his stuff for a lot of it and used it as material and, and redid it so that you never saw any Kovacs. They redid it in color and, and that was that. And she said, you know, I have dozens of the top producers in Hollywood want to do a documentary about my husband. And I won't give them the material because I want to have con creative control over it. And she said, I would like you to tell my husband's story. And I said, Edie, I am not a documentary filmmaker, okay? I am a storyteller, but the stories I tell are only six or eight or nine minutes long. I've never made a documentary. She said, just tell it like a long, real people story. She said, I will give you all of the material. So I said, okay, Edie, I'll tell you what I will do. You give me all of his material. She gave me like 35 hours of all his material. So I had to transfer all this stuff and I had to look all the way through it. And I said, this is what I'll do. I will make and tell his story the way I see it and the way I feel it. You have creative control after I finished. And if you don't like something that I have done, you are free to change it. But if you change it to the point where I don't like it, I don't want my name associated with it. And I'll just give it to you. And you can do whatever you want with it. I said, the other thing is, uh, I had to give, 
I had to find a place to sell it, and I sold it almost immediately to Greg Natherson, who was at uh, Showtime, who was a fan of mine and tried to put me on the air a couple of times and was a fan of uh, real people. And I said to Edie, I will take no writing fee. I will take no producing fee. I will take no fee whatsoever. What I will do is I will give 10% of the fee that I get from Showtime and I give it to Henry Bollinger because he's the one that sort of really got us together. And the reason you called, I said, after that, if there were any profits, we will split them 40-40. But, but the, uh, the first monies that come in will go to you and to Henry Bollinger. And so she agreed. And I made the documentary. She never touched one single bit about the documentary. Now, the wonderful thing about this, I mean, it was a monster hit on Showtime. The wonderful thing about the documentary, if you watch it, you watch me introducing the man and his work. When you see his work and how clever and how brilliant it is, you're just a fan immediately. But then all of a sudden, halfway through the documentary, you start to hear about Ernie Kovacs life story. Ernie Kovacs divorced his first wife. And the two children were not Edie's uh, uh, children. They were Ernie's children. And his first wife kidnapped the children while he was a star on television. So for two years, he hired private detectives to try to track down the first wife and then the children. He was w one of the first men in America to gain custody of his children in a uh, divorce settlement. The other problem that Ernie had is he was an unbelievable gambler. He lost thousands of dollars. There's a really funny story in there about a bunch of guys come to the house to play poker. And Edie hides the poker table. There's no place to play poker. So Ernie goes and gets a <laughs> screwdriver and he unscrews the hinges on the door and puts the door on a couple of chairs. And that becomes a place <laughs> where they play poker. Well, in those days, the income tax bracket was 90%. Mm -hmm. So aside from paying uh, detectives to try to find uh, his daughters, he's paying 90% to the federal government in taxes. And then of course, in his middle four, and, and he also becomes a movie star. And all of the parts that he was up for eventually went to Walter Matthau. And you will see there's a strong physical resemblance between him and Walter Matthau. Now there's sort of a, a semi uh, sad, heartbreaking ending to this because I never got absolutely one penny from this. I never made a DVD, any of that. Uh, a, a couple of times I gave it to PBS as one of their fundraisers, but of course I called Edie. By this time, I had the right to do anything with it I wanted. So uh, uh, after the uh, after the success of the original Garrison tapes, I tried to sell it to uh, to show uh, not to Showtime. I tried to sell it to the Comedy Channel. I tried to sell it to uh, Biography. I mean, it's a phenomenal film, and it should. Be. They all turned it down. Now, whether they turned mm -hmm. it down because I was trying to tell. Garrison's story in another documentary, I have no idea, but I never got a cent from that. Also, I never got a cent from the first uh, Garrison film. Uh, Freddie Weintraub, the partner I brought in, eventually ended up with most of that money, but I didn't care because at least the Garrison story was out there. Ernie Kovacs story was out there. And then about 15 years ago, oh, then... Because of the success of the documentary, ABC called Edie. And they did a film with Jeff Goldblum. God, what horrible casting. About <laughs> Ernie Kovacs. And they paid Edie a fortune for the rights to adapt the stuff from the documentary and become a consultant on that film. So she started to get rich. I never saw a penny. 
But 15 years ago, 14 years ago, I get a note from her lawyer that she is thinking of suing me because I had tried to sell it to uh, the comedy channel who didn't buy it and to biography who didn't buy it. And I sent back a note. I said, first of all, if you look at the agreement after uh, so many years, seven years, I now have the right to sell it. I've given it to PBS as a fundraiser, which is a public service. And of course, she gets to sing this, uh, the, the theme song at the end of the movie, which is called Send in the Clowns, which is really a smart touch on my part. And um, so I, I said, you know, you better set up a meeting with me and Edie because I think she's a little out of line. Well, that meeting didn't come up for a couple of years. I never got an apology, but I called Henry Bollinger uh, because I heard now that Edie Adams was a millionaire. But how could she get to be a millionaire just from what ABC was paying her for the rights to the film? And so I called Henry and I said, can we go back to the London Grill? I would like to see Edie and have a chat with her. So we met and we sat at this very same table and Edie was very, very, very quiet. And I said, Edie, I'm so glad that I hear that you're now in the 1% uh, where I used to be, but I no longer am. And I said, as you know, I didn't make any money from doing this documentary for you. And I'm just so delighted that I did it. And, and you know, I'm, so I have no hard feelings about that. But why on earth would you have contacted a lawyer and not just picked up the phone and called me. And then also I hear from Henry Bollinger that maybe some of the money is not coming from ABC or uh, anybody buying Ernie stuff because nobody's buying it, but it's coming from George Slaughter, whom you wanted to kill because he was stealing your husband's material. And she said she'd sold a bunch of it to George just very recently. And that's how she got to be very, very rich. And I said, why would you do that? Why did you do that to the man who stole your husband's work in the first place? A man who literally said publicly you wanted to kill. Why would you do that? And tears just rolled down her face. And she said, John, I needed the money. I was tired of being broke. And, you know, for years... You know, when Ernie died, as you tell so well in the movie, he owed a fortune to the IRS. And I paid off every single cent of it. I didn't want to be poor anymore. I wanted to be rich again. And now I'm rich. So that was the last I ever spoke to her. But the, for me, one of the greatest things that ever happened to her was meeting George Burns. So that's the end of the story about the Ernie Kovacs thing. But you go to, uh, uh, there's more material about it, of course, in the book, but you go to www.johnbarbersworld.com. It's in, I believe, nine or 10 parts, which are about nine or 10 minutes each. So it's very, very easy to watch. And I'm telling you, it is totally thrilling, wonderful film. So there you go. Well, much of what you do is, is gripping and d deeply insightful, cutting edge and, and uh, brave. I mean, speaking up for Jim Garrison and the Kennedy case um, cost you jobs in some ways. And many people, you know, disappeared in strange ways and passed away in strange ways during that time. I think you're a brave man. Um, I know you say that the case pretty much should be solved and we should just go down and pick it and demand that they reopen the case. But any, I agree with that. But is there anything that came out in the documents that you've released? And could you tell us where people can find them? In the JFK case, the uh, the extra documents you've put out, oh. and has anything come to your attention that maybe we uh, haven't heard that you'd like to bring up from well, them? I, I've talked about this on a, a couple of shows, and obviously it wasn't you, yours. You know that um, Congress mandated after uh, uh, JFK Oliver Stone's excellent film, and by the way, this past November at the Kappa. Citizens Against Political Assassinations at their CAPRA conference in November, Oliver Stone, now it was never broadcast. And Oliver Stone said, 
you must watch John Barber's film with Jim Garrison. And she sa he says it three times. I, and he, I had never heard from him from the time it was released. And I was hoping to get a note saying thank you to me because it reinforced everything that he put in his movie. Uh, a friend of mine, whose name is Tyler Nixon, is uh, one of Roger Stone's attorneys. And he and another attorney named uh, 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 Lloyd were uh, at the Kappa conference. And one of them had a cell phone. And they were just videotaping Oliver Stone when Oliver Stone was talking about how wonderful the last word on the assassination is. And of course, I turned it into a, uh, a YouTube, and it's up on YouTube, but it was an early Christmas card from from uh, from Oliver Stone. So, but in, in, in any event, uh, when uh, uh, Oliver's film came out, in the early 90s, Congress passed the uh, JFK Assassinations Records Act. And they mandated by last October that all the files would have to be released by the CIA. And of course, Trump said, you know, we're going to have released a lot of the JFK files. And then come last October, the CIA, CIA says, uh, Mr. President, we can't do that national security. Now, Donald Trump, I'm sure, never said to them, what's a 54-year-old murder got to do with national security? He just caved into them. But it felt, does the name Jefferson Morley ring a bell to you? Um, yeah, I did an article on David Ferry that I was led to through his research with Rick Bauer, who knew him, but not to go too much into that. He was uh -huh. gracious enough to set up a piece that I wrote. And, well, uh, you, I write, you write great pieces. Anyway, Jefferson Morley was suing the CIA to release files. Now, you know and I know that, that these secret agencies don't tell the truth. They talk in code. So any files released by the CIA are not going to say, this is how we killed the son of a bitch in Dealey Plaza. It's all in code. So that's no threat. They could release everything, and we would discover almost nothing except what liars they were and how much they controlled the American media. The files that Jefferson Morley was suing for, and he spent five years in the courts, were Jim Garrison's files. Because Jim Garrison said all his files, this is all this is all in the in the book, and it's all in the uh, documentary, the American media, uh, in the second assassination of President John F. Kennedy. When the House Select Committee was accidentally created, and the guy that was going to solve the case, Richard Sprague, said publicly he was going to solve the case, and was fired and replaced by a CIA hack, G. Robert Blakey, Garrison had been subpoenaed to testify and he didn't go. And he said to me, the reason I didn't go is because when I subpoenaed the CIA people, they tore up my subpoenas and they didn't come to the Clay Shaw trial, so screw them. I just sent them the documents. So the CIA has Garrison's documents and that's what Jefferson Morley wanted. The Central Intelligence Agency has no right to own Jim Garrison's documents from a New Orleans VA. They're not the government's. They are Jim Garrison, but they won't release them. Now, Jefferson Morley spent five years in a court and ended up uh, about nine months ago in, in Washington, D.C., his last chance before a judge. And the judge ruled against Jefferson Morley and in favor of the CIA keeping the garrison files all locked up. Now, for your information, the Warren Report files will be released in the year 2039. You won't see garrisons for another 25 years after that because they named names. He solved it. But guess who the judge was that ruled against Jefferson Morley? You got me with that one. Brett Kavanaugh. This I did not know. Brett Kavanaugh, the guy that he appointed to the Supreme Court. So there's something very fishy going on here. He's talking on the one hand, I'm going to have the files released. On the other hand, he appoints a, a Supreme Court justice who won't let Garrison's files out. 
So because of that, I decided that I owed it to Jim Garrison's memory and especially to the people of the United States of America that gave me a home after I was deported twice trying to get into the place, I'm going to release some of Jim Garrison's files. So I have released the first, I've released the first five files. I'm working on the sixth one now. I would have done one a month, but I am so swamped with all the other stuff that I'm doing. And I felt so strongly that the first two files are so laden with information you don't have to buy a book, anybody's book, Devil's Chessboard, or any book. You don't have to see any documentary or any. Just look at the uh, Oswald Files. They're called the Garrison Files. Oswald, the Garrison Files, Clay Shaw. You will learn immediately that Jim Garrison solved the case in 1967 when he said he solved the case. You don't have to look at anything else but that. So again, after you look at the Ernie Kovacs uh, special, just it's uh, one of them, the Oswald file is like eight minutes. And I think the Shaw, uh, uh, no, the Shaw file is like eight minutes. And the Oswald file is about 15 minutes. So 25 minutes or so. You just look at that. You are going to be so astounded with the unbelievable proof. Now, if you want a couple of things that are in these files you'd like to hear about, now, I'd be happy to tell you. Well, of course, I want the people to, I just want to say one thing. I don't often schmooze. Like I try to be kind, but I don't like to say things I don't mean. And both your Garrison documentaries affected me as a human being. I know that sounds a little funny to say and a little bombastic, but I mean it. After I started looking into this case, um, and any small thing I've written has been based on people like you who've done things in a big way. And they've affected people like me who've seen them. So I was deeply moved by both. I think you could tell by the, that I'm not kidding, by the amount of time I think you would know I spent, you know, researching. And, and, and your movies, Gar, you know, and Garrison inspired me. He was a regular person, as we all are. That you know, was the, that, things, but he was Bob, such a dedicated Bob. man. That is the key to the effectiveness of the documentary. I am a storyteller. I'm, I, I, I don't know what other, I don't, I'm inept at almost everything else in my life, but I am a really good storyteller. And the reason is because when I was almost a semi-orphan kid, I spent my time in the, in the theater for five cents. I could see a double feature at the Manor Theater in Toronto. Fell in love with the stories of movies. I realized they were all fiction when I eventually got to be an adult. You know, when I was a kid, I was surprised when someone was evil. Now that I'm an adult, I'm surprised when they're good. And then I used to spend my time in the public library. I knew where it was because it was right across from the police station, where I also spent a lot of time. And then on the radio, I used to listen to Lorne Green, the voice of the CBC, who eventually came to this country and did Ben Cartwright on Bonanza. He had this Orson Welles voice and would tell stories. I was raised on stories. Listening to them kept me alive. And as I got older, it was telling them. Either it was telling them as a comic or as a storyteller. So the thing that pleases me the most, the reason that the... Uh, the Kovacs documentary is so arresting is you're not watching a comic at work. You're watching a man trying to survive in life who happens to be a talented genius and is being thwarted by everything around him. And the same thing with Jim Garrison. You see what an absolute magnificent human being this man is. Now, look at, let's face it, he was an A personality, was like John Kennedy or Donald Trump. He was a womanizer. But that has nothing to do with how he did his job. I mean, look here, at, here. I mean, Picasso, he wouldn't paint a woman unless he slept with her first, no matter what she looked like. But look at the art that he created. I mean, creative people are highly, highly, highly sexual. So, but I, I'm going to give you a couple of little tidbits from the Shaw file and the Oswald file. And from the uh, Oswald file, there are two things 
that are absolutely astonishing to me. First of all, what he does in the Oswald file, this is how smart he is. He gathers information that was broadcast or printed the very hour of the assassination. So he got uh, radio reports, television reports, newspaper headlines, the medical reports from Parkland. And right away we see Dr. Perry said the throat wound is an entrance wound before the CIA gets to him. You see newspaper headlines that said second shooter at large, a newspaper headline that disappeared. And then Garrison, uh, you know, he says, when there's an ordinary bank robbery, the, uh, the police immediately set up a perimeter of roadblocks around. He said, they have, they have the reports from the FBI and the local police calling off the roadblocks. So this would assist anybody who was trying to get away. But the, uh, the most telling thing to me you and Warren and everybody who has seen any Oswald, even if they've not seen my film, you see a newspaper man with a microphone and he's leaning into Oswald and he's saying, did you kill the president? And Oswald said, that's the first time I've heard this. And he's not angry or fluff. He's very calm and he's very peaceful. He said, this is the first time I've heard this. I need, uh, 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 I need somebody to come forward and assist me. Again, he's very, very calm. Now, I never quite understood that. I, I understood the fact that he says it's the first time I've heard this. And I understand the fact that he's being very calm and peaceful. But I don't understand the context from where it came. But I liked listening to it, as did everybody else, because it was Oswald. What Garrison found out this clip followed an eight-hour interview of Oswald in Chief Curry's office. Now, any idiot, any idiot knows that Chief Curry said, we don't have room for a stenographer and we don't have room for a tape recorder. That alone tells you they're in bed with the CIA and the FBI and murdering the President of the United States. And uh, there were uh, maybe uh, eight or nine huge detectives in there with Magnums and Stetsons. And you got this 21-year-old kid, and there were a bunch of guys in there with blue suits. Jim Garrison found one of the guys in, in there who was an honest cop. And, and, and I must tell you, if let's say there are 14 guys in the office, 11 of them are honest. But it only takes two or three at the top to make them cave in. And what Garrison found was an honest cop who said no one ever got to ask Oswald in that office if he either shot Kennedy or shot Tippett because they were prevented by the guys in the blue suits. Now, you know how telling this is. The reason that the blue suits wouldn't let Oswald talk is as a, or hear that question because as a 21-year-old, he'd probably panic. And he'd say, Jesus Christ, no, are you kidding me? I'm sent here by the CIA as part of a team to infiltrate the assassins and, and prevent the assassination. I'm just a patsy. He would have screamed it then and there. He never heard it until he left that office and then this newsman came over and said it. That speaks volumes at how brilliant Garrison is. Now, a lot of people don't know uh, that he won half of the, the trial, the Clay Shaw trial. He lost the conspiracy case. And the movie opens with a 1967 documentary from the CIA, probably accidentally released. And the CIA addresses the legal department saying we have to give Clay Shaw help in New Orleans. Otherwise, Jim Garrison's going to get a conviction for conspiracy. It was a slam dunk. Of course, they infiltrated the office with eight different people. So, and, and a couple of them are in the film. But he won the perjury case, which, which is, was his big case that Clay Shaw and David Ferry and Lee Harvey Oswald were together talking about the assassination of John Kennedy. And this was, uh, and they had 
87 witnesses. And in eight minutes, the jury found him guilty. And then immediately the government stepped in and stopped the investigation. Now, here's what is revealed, just two or three things in the Clay Shaw files. First of all, the problem the garrison had was proving he was CIA, because on the stand he lied. He said he wasn't. But they all lie. That's what they do. They, they're liars. The Constitution, Bill of Rights, means nothing to the Central Intelligence Agency. As George Bush said, it's just a goddamn piece of paper. So in, in, any, in any event... Garrison gets 10 years of employment records and tax records. And there you have it, two companies aligned to the CIA and found, funded by the CIA, one of them the Mississippi River Shipping Company and the other Permandex. So you have that. But now the jury didn't quite believe that. So Garrison thought, well, maybe there's another motive. He finds out that Shaw and a couple of other guys pay a million dollars for a nickel mine in Cuba which is confiscated by uh, Castro after the rev revolution. And, of course, uh, Sean and his partners think, well, after uh, the uh, Air Force comes in and helps the Bay of Pigs, we'll get our uh, nickel mine back. But then Kennedy said no, and they never got the nickel mine back. But here's what else he had. Clay Shaw and Garrison would never allow this in the conspiracy trial. Clay Shaw was a raving, sadomasochistic homosexual. That was his lifestyle and that was his private business, according to Garrison, because it had nothing to do with the assassination. But nobody in New Orleans or America knew that because Garrison wouldn't release it because he said it had nothing to do with the uh, planning of the murder, but it has everything to do with winning the perjury trial. And he knew it. And what he had, a letter from a guy named Lesnick at a university in Chicago, whose roommate was Clay Shaw's lover for a year. And he replaced the other male roommate because that roommate had a transsexual operation to become a woman. And when he became a she, Shaw kicked her out. Then he had four 20-year-old male hookers with affidavits that said for 20 bucks they performed these acts for Clay Shaw, David Ferry, and Lee Harvey Oswald. And that's something you never hear about Lee Harvey Oswald. I think I had, when I had Judith Barry Baker on my show, I asked her if she, he was bisexual and she insisted that he was heterosexual. But if you see the, the picture in the documentary or the picture of all these guys together, they're at a gay party. And then, of course, uh, to me, the most damaging thing is there's a guy named James Whalen. James Whalen comes to Jim Garrison and says, I've just been offered $25,000 to murder you. And I'll fill out any affidavit you want. Money was offered to me by Clay Shaw and David Ferry. $10,000 in advance and $15,000 afterwards. And I must tell you, Mr. Garrison, I seriously thought about it. I said, but I couldn't. It's just too big for me. And he said, and I didn't, I didn't want the money. I would have spent the money on doctors. The only reason I did it is Clay Shaw promised me the government would supply the greatest doctors in America to cure my ill daughter. But I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. Give me an affidavit, I'll fill it up. The affidavit is in the files, $25,000. Now, Garrison knew that Clay Shaw does not want any of these witnesses introduced into a courtroom. Otherwise, his reputation as an upstanding civil servant in a businessman in New Orleans would go down the tube. And if he gets to this trial, he's gonna get at least 99 years in prison. And the government stepped in and stopped it. Jim Garrison solved the case. It's a cold case. That's why all of these meetings are an absolute total waste of time. Uh, Judith Barry Baker, I mean, uh, I've sent her notes. I said, hey, you grieve by yourself now. How long have you been grieving? 54 years? Okay, let's say 25 years is enough grief. Now, how about some revenge? Quit holding these things in, in Dallas, for God's sake. Take your 
rent a hotel in Washington, D.C., across from the Justice Department, and get important speakers to speak there. And after you speak, march on the Justice Department. Guess what? She's planning another one of those stupid, wasteful conferences. Now, I have close friends that I had met down there who love her and admonish me for telling her that, that she shouldn't be. You know what Einstein said insanity is? Doing the same thing repeatedly. Yeah, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. That's what these things are. They're aw- now, listen, there are millions of interesting stories about the assassination and sidebar stories. But for God's sakes, it's solved. Now, if, you know, where are all these people? Why aren't they marching on the, the Justice Department? And I don't want to mention the names of the famous people who should be marching on the Justice Department, but they should. It, you know, it's... It, and. There are two things that I would hope. President Trump, because of the bungling of the Democrats, is going to be handed the key to the White House for 2020. I'm going to tell you something else. I I have predicted successfully every election for the last 50 years, and not because I'm a political pundit. I'm not. I'm primarily, hopefully, an entertainer and a storyteller, but when you tell jokes... Those people who get the biggest laughs and the jokes are the ones who lose the elections. Donald Trump has handed this trophy by the Democrats and their stupidity. And what may happen, you may see Donald Trump and his supporters introducing an amendment that would allow the president of the United States to continue in office after third term. The reason we only have two terms is because the fascists and the bankers who first tried to murder FDR had it not been for a brigadier general named Smedley Butler who uh, exposed him, and that includes George Bush's grandfather. And none of these, yes, and none of these people were arrested for treason or executed or hung as they should have been. And their survivors are still running everything. They're the people doing the killing. They elevate politicians or they eliminate them. And this Buttigieg, the mayor from Indiana, wherever he's from, he's CIA. How can a guy who's almost unknown get all this? And how is it that Hillary and Bill Clinton, who are surrounded by all these accidental deaths surviving, they were recruited in college for crying out loud. And when... Congressman Hale Boggs, who was the one who told Jim Garrison that Oswald did not do it. Hale Boggs was the only dissenting member of the Warren Commission. It was never printed. He went before Congress and we said we need a new investigation. The FBI and the CIA has lied to us. And he called Hoover a Nazi, did he? Uh, say that again? I think he called Hoover a Nazi and then his plane went down. Yes, and guess, yes, his plane disappeared over Alaska. They never found the plane or him. But guess who drove him to the airport? Bill Clinton. Billy Clinton. Yeah. There you go. He was recruited when he was in college, and they sent him to the Soviet Union for crying out loud. How come these people keep surviving with all the blunders that they commit? It's because, now, this, 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 there are many people in the, what's called the Q movement or uh, Trumpaholics who were, think that he's the second coming, for crying out loud, who believe the same forces that eliminated John Kennedy are out to get Donald Trump. And it may be true in one respect. It's the CIA. I think even the whistleblower uh, about the Ukraine was CIA. They're all over the place. They infect us. And you know Why? because we don't have any enemies anymore. As Pogo said in his uh, cartoon uh, strip, uh, Walt Kelly, Walt Kelly who writes Pogo, it was in the mid seventies, they said, I've seen the enemy and it is us. We're We're allowing this country to be destroyed by the greed of the small faction of 1%. It's unfettered, unchecked capitalism. How is it that a monster like Amazon pays no taxes? I mean, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, but in any event, 
If you go to www.johnbarbersworld.com and just Google the Garrison Files on Shaw and Lee Harvey Oswald, that's all you need to. Uh, that's all you need to look at. Well, Warren's been waiting patiently on the prison block. He's four subs down from me, and they give us this podcast <laughs> equipment for three hours. But I had one more question, a serious one. Um, if John Lennon were alive. I picture him saying things akin to what you're seeing now. Had he lived, what do you think he might be saying today? Well, I have mixed emotions about that because I think John Ken John Lennon was the uh, the intellectual force behind the Beatles. They're not them, and probably half of the musical force. Uh, Harrison uh, made a lot of musical contribution, and of course, uh, uh, George made a lot of contributions but the intellect came from John Lennon and there's John Lennon in our movie saying I think our world and our country is run by the insane for insane reasons and there's a wonderful documentary I believe it's on HBO and it's called the United States of America versus John Lennon mm -hmm. the um, United States murders every peacemonger that comes our way they murdered Robert Kennedy. They murdered Martin Luther King. Malcolm X had a turnabout and thought we should all get together, and they gunned him down. And John Lennon was murdered also by the Central Intelligence Agency, and probably so was Robert, uh, so was John Kennedy Jr. But when I said I had second results, there was at one point John Lennon stopped talking politically. When he was finally allowed to stay in the country, he said, you know what? That's enough of this for me. I think I'm going to go back to music. So I don't know. Uh, but he was such an intellect. I don't think that he could have swallowed what is happening in this country, in this world, without saying something. And he may have said it in song. Now, Paul McCartney, he says nothing. And that's why people love him. Well, one good thing about Paul that I didn't know until recently, if I could interject for a second, it was... Paul offered Mark Lane back in the day when he did his film That's he right. to do the soundtrack for him. And they said to him, he said to him, why do you want to do this? And he said, because for my children, I'm paraphrasing, but for my children, I want to do something uh, more important than just being a Beatle. So I think he, he might care a little more behind the scenes and be a more charitable guy than we might suspect. Well, I think you're absolutely right about that. And I'm glad you mentioned that because Paul indeed did do that, uh, and uh, he meant it. And I'm sure behind the scenes, he's probably doing things that we are not aware of. But you know, it seems to be when you get to be the richest entertainer on the planet, uh, there comes a time when maybe you don't have to sing another song. And there comes a times when maybe, but who knows what he would say. Maybe, maybe he likes the way the world is. You know, as I maybe mentioned earlier. even knighted. <laughs> huh? He's what? Sir Paul. I wonder if John would be Sir John Lennon if he would have accepted such a thing. I think uh, uh, if he would, he probably would have used it as a platform to say something, you know. Uh, but look, at the, uh, to me, one of the most reprehensible things, I know there are a lot of people who are applauding the fact that Donald Trump is going to give the Medal of Freedom to Rush Limbaugh. He is a right-wing, warmongering fascist who supported George Bush during the fake Iraq war. I do not think he's an entertainer. That's all he is, but he's a political entertainer. I don't think any awards should go to anybody who divides a country. Awards should go to people who are uniting a country. And that's why artists and singers and writers usually get awards, because these are people who bring people together. Rush Limbaugh brings him apart. He used to scream at the top of his lungs, which is very entertaining. And it isn't a kind of appropriate that that's where he got cancer. It's like the guy that came, uh, uh, the, the uh, senator who came up with the uh, magic bullet theory for crying out loud. Arlen okay. Spectre. Huh? Arlen Specter. Arlen Specter. Guess what? He came up with brain cancer thinking about something as nonsensical as that, the mi missing bullet, bullet 399. There is more metal in Connolly's wrist and in his leg than is missing from bullet 399. And it's, uh, 
I mean, it's all Saturday Night Live cartoon. And nobody questions it, and they still don't question it to this day. And do you know that the movie, The American Media and the Second Assassination of President John F. Kennedy, is an absolute monster hit on Amazon? I believe it. Just, I mean, just word of mouth. Word of mouth. It's just, it's just astonishing. As a matter of fact, Dr. Cyril Weck, who I admire enormously because he was one, he was the very first doctor to question the magic bullet theory and never caved into it, as did Biden and a couple of other, uh, Biden or whatever his name is, they caved in, but not Cyril Weck. They contacted me last week and they asked me if I would bring my film to the Kappa Conference in Dallas in November to speak there, to present the film, and then to the next day to do it at a university, which I would prefer to do at a university so the young kids could see it. And uh, I'm, I'm doing it because of my admiration for Cyril Weck, the opportunity to talk to students who live in a different world than I do, uh, even though they were geographically in the same country. And also, I'm going to be doing a bunch of book signings. And so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, also, the first week in April, I'm going to be in Toronto at Indigo in Eaton's, uh, the biggest bookstores in uh, Canada, and I'll be doing local media there. And then the following week, I'll be in New York doing the very same thing. So anyway, that's my agenda, and I'm glad you and Warren called me to be on your show tonight. I'm delighted. Well, we questions for you, too, but can I make one suggestion before I hand over to him. Your mother's not a virgin. The bumpy life and times of the Canadian dropout or change the face of American TV. We did something for uh, Ken Mansfield, who is the president of Apple Records, who came on the show. Warren makes really good commercials. And he did one just for his book. It got thousands and thousands of views. So if Mike Farrell wanted to come on Skype with Warren and do a commercial for your book and a testimonial, we'd spread that all over YouTube. And our Warren has a tremendous amount of followers. I'd say at least 50,000. I have about seven. So that's 50,000. Uh, well, uh, you know what? We'd air it for you. Let me tell you something. I would never ask Mike to do that. I wouldn't ask anybody to do that. What I'm going to send you, when I went to Toronto, uh, I went to Canada the first time a few months ago, I made a two minute and 37, 20 second commercial about my book uh, and my trip to Canada. I will send that to you and Warren, and if Warren thinks it's worthy, he can add something to the beginning of it and the end of it and put it up. That I would deeply appreciate. Well, he'd be happy to do that. I'm sure he would. His artwork is beyond brilliant. It's just outstanding. So that's what I would do. But I would never ask Mike Farrell or anybody that I know to do me such a favor. Well, as so you like it, we'll go with your wishes, whichever one you want to do. But... Warren's given me a lot of leeway, so I thank him for that. And I know that you guys are uh, simpatico, so I put you two together now, and he'll ask you his question. That's that's great. Okay, so I will do that in a minute as soon as I get off. So if you do have one last question to ask me before I go. Um, I got more than one, but I'll I'll leave it at one if, that's, uh, if you're on a time restraint. Uh, Maybe you can fine. go back on again and we'll do another show next week so he doesn't beat me up. For, you know, <laughs> I, I said I can't do it next week. I'm on my way, way to uh, Los Angeles. There's a fellow named Stu uh, uh, Shatak. Stu is the only one on the internet who has dedicated his life's work to preserving classic television. And he got a hold of my book when it first came out. And he'd have me in L.A. We went live for four hours, for God's sake. And wow. we never got to the point where we got to real people. So he said, hold it. You're going to come back for three hours. I'm going to run videos and stuff like that. So I'm uh, preparing to go down and to do that. And then I'll be uh, doing two or three other uh, quite large sh uh, shows. Uh, and then I'm going to be off to Canada again for part two of my book tour. So anyway, Warren, ask me anything you wish. Okay. okay. Um, 
I appreciate everything that you do for us, uh, John. It's uh, very nice of you to come on the show, and I enjoy listening to your stories. I think you're an honest man, um, and you speak from the heart, and I appreciate that very much. And uh, whenever you can come on again, we'd be glad to have you. Rather, it's in a month, two months, three months, it don't matter. Um, uh, we would love to have you on at any time. But um, my first question is, um, you posted something on Facebook uh, the other day about a friend of yours who had recently passed away. It was a past show you did with him. Uh, you did an interview of him. And I'd like to know your thoughts on that. And I'm talking about Kirk Douglas. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. Did you see it? Did you watch it? Yes, I did, sir. Well, I was astounded. Absolutely and totally astounded because, you know, uh, I admired uh, uh, Kirk Douglas enormously and not just for a couple of the films that he made because as wonderful as Paths of Glory was, it was a Stanley Kubrick film and as magnificent as Champion was, I think it was a Stanley Kramer film. Okay, so uh, Kirk was just the actor, but he was a guy that got rid of the blacklist in the United States of America, the only one with the balls to do it. And the only one in a position to be able to do it. And uh, that was because he hired Dalton Trumbo uh, mm -hmm. to write the script to Spartacus. Dalton Trumbo was probably the uh, next to Patty Shayevsky. Patty Shayevsky wrote the most magnificent script ever in American movies. And of course, that was Network. And when I reviewed it, I said, that's the only American movie that will, people will go to to listen to because the words are so wonderful. But uh, next to him, it's Dalton Trumbo. And I had interviewed Dalton in 1970. Now, this was a few years after Kirk Douglas got him off of the, uh, got him off of the blacklist. And he came on and he had written a book called Letters to My Son. God, it is so magnificent. So anyway, I, of course, handed him the book on the air. And I said, okay, this is letters to your son. Now sign an autograph to my son. So my son treasures that book to this day. We have it in the, in the, in the safe. So that's why I admire Kirk more than anything. But then he called on his own wow. to come on the show. Mm. And then he showed up and there's nobody with him. <laughs> he is by himself and he's going around introducing himself to everybody I mean it was just a, and then we sat down and I must tell you he and I could have talked for hours and in and when and, and the uh the interesting thing to me was that uh, I have interviewed probably a thousand really famous and powerful people and almost every one of them has invited me and my wife and my son to their house or dinner or lunch, I turned every single one of them down. Mm. The only two I never turned down are Jane Fonda. And that magnificent story, funny too, is in your mother's not a virgin. And the other one was Kirk Douglas. And guess what? Kirk wanted to plug his book, but he got <laughs> so enraptured in just having this conversation that he forgot to plug the book. So he said, <laughs> John, I want you and your wife and your son to come to my house. I'm having a book party and I want you there. And uh, this, uh, the story about being at the house, I took out of the book, sadly, because I spent most of my time with Johnny Carson's wife, which Johnny Carson hated because she enjoyed my company more than his. And then a, and a great agent by the name of Swifty Lazar. So, uh, and and uh, I'm so glad you remembered that. I, I, that touched me. But you know what else touched me? And I hope you look at it, Warren. Mm -hmm. Is uh, 
I had won another Emmy for the, uh, that show. And you can mm. see why, because it was really a good show. And yep. my show was canceled. And so what I did, and I just posted it two nights ago. And already yes. over 100 and some odd people looked at it. What I did is I canceled any guests we were going to have. And I decided since we were going to go live, that I would just open up the phones and I would talk to people who are watching the show. Mm. There are two phone calls that moved me enormously. And I think the smartest call came from a 10 year old boy named Gary. And I suggest you go to YouTube and just John Barber, uh, Google John Barber's last, final half hour, final show. And just watch me and listen to me talking to the audience, but listen to what the audience has to say. The people who were watching television at that time were the smarter than the people who were putting on television. <laughs> so so any, anyway, if you want one last story, I'll tell you one last story before we go that's related to, uh, to uh, the uh, documentary, the Uni Kovacs documentary. Are you still there, Bob? I am enraptured at your storytelling, sir. I am very present. Okay. Uh, this I'm going to close with this story because to me, not doing the documentary about Ernie Kovacs, I love the fact that I did it and I'm proud of it. It's forgotten. The thing for me that meant the most was meeting uh, George Burns. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell oh, you. God. Huh? I said, oh, God. Oh, God is right. <laughs> there is a wonderful three and a half page story that I'm going to tell you now. I love to read it from the book uh, because I wouldn't like to get it wrong. Now, so I'll, and, and I don't, don't want to look for it now because it's too hard to find in 752 pages. <laughs> so I'm going to try to tell it as briefly as, as I can. And the, in the book, it's called A Late Night Dinner with George Burns. There was a restaurant in Hollywood called Scandia, and it was at the uh, corner of Sunset and Doheny. And it had the greatest late night dinners in Los Angeles. And after I would go to a, a movie or a play or a concert with my wife, which I had to review as a critic, we would go to Scandia for the late night dinner that started at 10 o'clock at night. And you get a very small filet mignon and one large beef steak tomato. That was all. But God, was it delicious. And a mm. glass of wine. Anyway, after the Ernie Kovacs documentary was such a huge success on Showtime, Edie Adams started getting calls, of course, from ABC to do the movie. But she got a call from the producer. And the producer said, you know, you sounded great. You say, still sing great. And he said, I know Frankie Lane still sings great. Don Cherry, there are a bunch of old time singers that still sing pretty well. If I can get to Pantages Theater for a Saturday night and put on a concert of just old time singers, five or six of you putting on, you know, singing your hit song. Would you do it? And, and Edie, of course, said, yes, I would love to do it. So the guy gets Frankie Lane and Edie and four others and books the Pantages Theater, which is where they used to hold the Academy Awards. And it sells out in like a day. Everybody wants to go. Well, Edie doesn't have a date. I mean, her publicist, uh, Henry Bollinger, is married and she doesn't usually go anywhere with him, but didn't want to consider it a date. So she called George Burns. And George said, yeah, I'll be your date. So George Burns took her. And my son, who was 13 at the time, and my wife and I, we went to the pantry. It was a great, great show. So when it was over, George started talking, as he does. That's why they would never let him play golf, because he couldn't stop <laughs> talking. So we're going out of theater. He's still talking. We're on the front seat, front of the sidewalk. And he's still talking. And I said, Mr. Burns, I got a great idea. I know you still have something else to say. I always take my wife and son to Scandia for a late night dinner. Do you mind if we go to Scandia? And I'll foot the bill for the late night dinner. So we get to Scandia. 
and it's 11 o'clock. They're almost ready to close out. Now, I figure that what they'll do for uh, Mr. Burns is they'll take him downstairs to the private dining room. He said, no, I want to sit right in the center. So he sat in the, we got a table and we all sat around this round table under the bright light because he loved the fact that all the customers were looking <laughs> at him. So he begins to tell stories about his life. And he tells the fact of, he talks about the fact that he hates sick people. He will never go to see sick people. He said his, his, his uh, sister was in the hospital and everybody thought she was going to die, but she got better. And when he heard she was feeling better, he decided that he would go visit her. So he went to the hospital and he walks in. He said, sis, I'm glad you're feeling better. And she said, no, I don't know that I am. He said, well, I'll be back when you are. And he left. Again. <laughs> he wouldn't be around her. But then he told, now, we're there till like 12 o'clock. Now, the restaurant's closed. And everybody is gone. All the customers are gone. The mater d and one waiter stays. And the place is deserted. It's just Edie and George, Henry Bollinger, myself, my wife, and my son, Christopher. And then George Burns says, this is my favorite show business story. So I said, listen, every story you tell is my favorite show business story. He said, well, you love this. It's about how Lucy became accidentally the biggest broad in television and the richest. And I said, okay, go ahead. So he lights another cigar and he starts to talk with this wonderful smile on his face. And you can hear that voice. And he's saying, you know, she had this great radio show. I love Lucy. And I can't, I can't imitate George Burns, so I'll just tell you the story. It says, uh, and her husband was a guy named Richard Denny. Looked like you, John. Uh, brownish hair, and blue eyes, nice looking fella. And of course, it's one of the top radio shows. And CBS is getting into the television business now. And so they want to do a television version I Love Lucy, which is a big hit on the radio. So they call Lucy and they say, hey, we want to do a pilot uh, of your uh, show uh, with you and Richard Denny. And she said, no. And they said, what do you mean? No, because television is going to be it. It's going to replace radio. You won't have a job soon. Radio will be dead soon. And she said, no, I want my husband. Everybody in the country knows I'm married to Desi Arnaz, for crying out loud. And if you're on television and they can really see me now, they'll see I'm not with my husband. And they said, no, you can't have a, a Cuban <laughs> for sake or a Mexican or a Latino as a husband in America. Are you kidding? And she said, no, I'm not kidding. So don't call me anymore. Well, they don't give up on it. You know, they don't like to be told no at the top of CBS. So they keep calling her. And she keeps saying, no, I am not doing a pilot with Richard Denning. I love Richard Denning and, and I'll do the radio show as long as we can continue to do it. But I'm not making a television show with him, only with my real husband, because people know I'm married to a Cuban. And she hung up. So they called back and they said, we have a proposition for you. And she said, what's the proposition? We'll do two pilots. We'll do one pilot with your husband. She says, no, we're not doing two pilots. And they said, listen to us. We'll do a pilot with Desi. And if you do not like the pilot, we will then ask you to do a pilot with Richard Denning. She said, I'm doing the pilot with Desi. And they said, yes. And we're going to have creative control over how we do it? And they said, yes. So they shot the pilot. And of course, Desi decides that, hey, if we're going to do this, well, let's do it like a play. So they had three cameras. They've never had three cameras in a sitcom, for crying out loud. And we're going to have a live studio audience. And we're going to shoot it like a play. So Desi's immediately creative and innovative right off the bat. And so they do the pilot. The pilot ends up going from Hollywood to New York. And somebody is screening it 
sort of unauthorized aside from the executives. The executives don't know quite what to make of it. And somebody else is screening it, and they're in the sales department. And a guy walks in who is the president of a cigarette company. And he can't believe what he's looking at. Oh, my God. And he goes back to the heads of CBS and orders 13 weeks of the show he just saw. And it's I Love Lucy with Desi Arnaz. So they call back Lucy and say, guess what? You've got a show. She says, what do you mean I've got a show? She said, and they said, oh, I wish I could remember the name of the sponsor. It's in, in the story. It's a famous tobacco company. Philip, oh, Philip Morris. No, it wasn't Philip Morris. It wasn't Philip Morris. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, they call her and say, we got it. And she says, no, you haven't. And then the guy says, Lucy, I hate to tell you this, but we've already sold it. It's been bought by a cigarette company. Oh, God. And uh, she said, great. no, you do not have the show. And they said, what do you mean we don't have the show? We just sold it. And she said, I'll tell you what. You guys do not have, you do not have my husband under contract. You never made a contract because you never thought he'd make it. So you and this cigarette company can blow the show up your ass. <laughs> and she hangs up. And they call back. And they have no choice but to give her ownership of I Love Lucy. And with the monies from that show, she buys Desilu Studios. And now we begin to see Star Wars, Star Wars and a bunch of other great shows. And that's how Lucy became the mega billionaire mogul that she was in Hollywood and one of the greatest, smartest women I have ever met. And George Burns ends the story by saying, I love that lady. So, <laughs> so that's how she got to be so big. Awesome story and one that I haven't heard. And just for the record, John, uh, Lucy is related to me. Are she you? is. She's my great aunt. <laughs> oh my God! How that's that's serendipity. I'll tell you something else wonderful about uh, about Lucy was uh, she loved my son. I'm, and when I send you the video of my book, which mm -hmm. I and, and I want you to prevail upon uh, the lovely lady at. Uh, at Beetle Magazine to run. She can pick any five-star review from either Goodreads or Amazon and run it because they're all five-star reviews. Okay. Okay. Have her do that. And anything you can, any of the magic you can work with, with my minute uh, thing, I would, I would be uh, delighted. But all right. Lucy was, I'll send you also the picture she took with my son, uh, when he was wearing his Star Trek stuff when he was like seven years old. Wow, that would be great. I would love to see that. Did you get to spend much time with her? Uh, I have never met her personally. Um, I only know stories from my mother and father um, about her. And uh, all I know is she's a great aunt of mine. And... Uh, that's as far as I go myself. And politically, she was unbelievably progressive. She was tough as nails, but she was sweet as nails. Sadly, she took to a little drink in her later life because she didn't have a man who could was her equal. I mean, even though she married a really nice guy, he was a he was a, a second rate comic, but he was a first rate mm -hmm. person, but not as smart as Lucy and. I had met the stories about how I had met Desi when I began to write Gomer Pyle and stuff like that were very disappointing when I met him. Uh, he turned mm -hmm. into a womanizer and a drunk himself. Anyway, Warren, Bob, I just love doing your show. Thank you so much for asking me on again. And I'm going to go hold up this thing again. Your That's mother's right. not a virgin. The bumpy you life and times of the Canadian dropout who changed the face of American television. So there great, you 
Great deal, John. And I appreciate you being on and you're welcome to come back on anytime you want. It's a joy to have you and I love your stories. Thank uh, you. Well, I'll be, I'll be uh, you know, when, maybe uh, when I get to Canada, I can call you because I have Skype on my phone. I won't have this background, but right. I have Skype on my phone and we can do a show from Canada. Uh, that sounds good to me. Just uh, give me a call or contact me on Facebook or Messenger or whatever way you want to do it. I'll give you my phone number if you'd like. Yeah, and, email, email me your, your phone uh, phone number. I think I have Bob's. And then, again, if you get a chance, now that you've seen the Kirk Douglas thing, watch the show I just posted yesterday where I just talked to the viewers and this uh, 10-year-old boy, his name was Gary. It just right. And the, another guy who called was a guy who called about the assassination because I had a detective on who wrote a book about it called Appointment in Dallas. Uh, so anyway, again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I'll talk to you from Canada. All right. Thank you hey. very much, John. I'll be thank there, you. Okay? <laughs> you have a good time and be safe, my friend. Okay, thanks so much. Bye-bye. And I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.